The Black Student Achievement Program, also known as the BSAP of the Howard County Public School System, has a summer program to prepare students for the upcoming school year. Ana Maria Lawson met up with BSAP Administrator of Summer Programs, Eugene Rose, to learn more. The Black Student Achievement Program, known as the BSAP, has been a part of the Howard County Public School System since 1986. There are several academic programs available to students to assist them in achieving their goals throughout the school year. I'm here at Harper's Choice Middle School to speak with Mr. Eugene Rose, Administrator for the BSAP Summer Program. Hello, hi Mr. Good Rose. Good morning. I'm Anna Maria Lawson. Thank you so much for meeting with me today. Thank you guys for coming out. So what exactly is the purpose of the BSAP program? Um, the students who come to our program over the summer will be exposed to the upcoming curriculum. So for example, an incoming ninth grader who's going into Algebra 1 will be exposed to the Algebra 1 curriculum over the summertime. So that way when a student go goes to first day of school, confidence is already set in because now they can raise their hand, they can answer those type of questions, and once that confidence starts from beginning, it carries them all the way through. That's great. So how long have you been with the program? Well, I've been with the program a total of eight years. My first few years with the program, I was actually a math teacher. That's my my first love is mathematics, so now I graduated to become one of the administrators for the program for the last several years. Well, that's great. So do you think you can show me around? Yes, going on a little tour? we have a lot of dynamic things going on. I think you guys will love this program. All right, right now we have our PE class. These students come here for health and fitness. Typically we have our sixth and seventh graders take this course so they can get their energy out for the rest of the day. Wow, that's really smart. So, Mr. Rose, what are the demographics of the program and what is the makeup of the students that attend summer school here? The makeup of our students in this case are students who are typically on grade level or above grade level. So, the enrichment piece helps them when they go on to the courses they take during a regular school year. So, what is the structure of the students' day and how many students would you say typically attend the summer program? All students take mathematics, social studies, and English. And then they have a, a gamut of subjects they can pick from. We have chess, we have creative writing, we have journalism, we also have African American studies, art, Spanish. So they get to pick one of those um, courses in the beginning of the day. And then in the second block, we have a different set of enrichments they can take. So we have a couple more things I'd like to show you. We have an awesome technology program. We can go right this way so we can see nice. that as well. Nice, let's go check it out. So can you explain the partnerships that you have? Yes, we actually have three partnerships this year. One partnership we have is with the Bridges program. Those students go to academic intervention in the morning time, then they come to us in the afternoon so they can enjoy our end of classroom enrichment such as basketball, hip hop dance, food nutrition, lacrosse, and martial arts. Our second partnership is with food nutrition. This partnership is with UMUC. So what they do is they come in the afternoon and the kids do food nutrition class. They grow their own garden, so they're doing their vegetables on site. Our last partnership is with First Tee of Howard County. The students go out Tuesdays and Thursdays to Fairway Hills Golf Course. Nice, very nice. So what feedback do you receive from the parents and how do you incorporate their suggestions into the curriculum? Well, every, at the end of every year, the parents are given a survey to fill out. And one of the things that the parents put out in the survey was that they wanted to be more rigor for the students throughout the program. So we developed our, a new progress report this year that gives the parents a little bit more concrete evidence of growth for their students throughout the program. Mr. Rose, everything you said sounds so interesting. Let's go check out the technology class in the computer lab. Okay, great. All right. Well, as you can see this year, we have a little bit more students than normal. On a typical basis, we normally have anywhere from 175 to 225 students attending the program. But this year, because of our partnership with the Bridges program, we have 267 students in the program. So where can parents get more information? Well, they can go to the Howard County Public School Systems website and everything is listed right there on the website. Okay, thank you. Well, it must be very rewarding for you to see each student reach their goals. It sure is. We like to call our students lifers. Um, once they start the program, they go all the way through the program, all the way to 10th grade, um, but it's an awesome program. Students have a great time. Yes, sounds like it. Thank you so much, Mr. Rose. It was a pleasure meeting with you today. On another topic, the Howard Community College will be having its annual Grand Prix. And joining us here in the studio is Missy Maddie, who's the Executive Director of the Howard Community College Educational Foundation, and Marilyn Doach, who's also not only the co-chair of the event, but also the owner of Marama Farm. Ladies, welcome. Okay, Missy, we're gonna start with you. And let's tell us a little bit, and go to my questions here. 
What is the Howard Community Grand Prix? And tell us a little bit about, you know, who it benefits. Uh, the Grand Prix, it's actually a fundraiser for Howard Community College to raise scholarships for students who want to attend HCC but may not financially be able to do that. It's an equestrian show jumping event. It's not a car Grand Prix like some people might be confused. It is an equestrian show jumping event where horses race the clock. They don't race each other. It's not a steeplechase uh, where there's individual jumps, you know, and they, they are um, judged by whether they knock any of the bars off of the jumps and so forth in their time. So they're judged just on style, more like style points and form, yes, yes. form points. Interesting, interesting, I know. Well, now how much has the Grand Prix so far contributed to scholarships over the, over the years? Uh, since the first year that it was a fundraiser for the college, it's raised over $2.6 million for scholarships wow. for students. That's, that's pretty good. I think it started back in 1988? Yes, it did, yeah. Why is it at Marama Farm? and, and um, Will it continue to be held there? The enrollment growth at the college has just been increasing by double digits. I mean, in the last couple of years, it's been like 12% increases. And we've had the number of students on campus, we don't have enough parking. And the Grand Prix field, unfortunately, just needed to be, the entire field needed to be used for parking for the number of students that we had. So we were looking for, we either had to get rid of the Grand Prix or find a new place. And you found a great place, it sounds like. Beautiful farm. So, Marilyn, how did uh, you become involved? How, how did it turn out that the Grand Prix moved over to the farm after all? Well, we had Missy come to the farm and basically asked mm -hmm. uh, if the Grand Prix could be held at the farm. They were looking at a few, you know, locations. Okay, several locations. And several and, locations, okay. several other farms. And uh, I, of course, you know, immediately said, you know, both my husband and I are, you know, staunch supporters of the college and said, absolutely, whatever we can do, we will continue to partner, you know, with the college and have it there, you know, in perpetuity as long as we can. Oh, wonderful. Now, when did you uh, first become involved in the horse industry? Uh, horses, per se, I was five years old when my father purchased my first little pony and I've been involved in one form or another with horses my entire life. Okay, tell us about some of the horses that you have. Well, uh, Marama Farm is a uh, thoroughbred breeding and racing farm. Um, my passion is breeding, so, so that's where my focus is, but uh, those that don't go to the sale we will keep and run in the state of Maryland uh, at places like Pimlico and Laurel um, and run on the circuit. Yeah. Okay, and you've been a supporter of the Grand Prix for many years. I know you're a supporter of the college. Just um, had you attended the event when it was at Howard Community College and you knew all about it? Because yes. what keeps you coming back like year after year for someone else that may have gone in the past? What would bring them back this year, do you think? Well, with the college, you know, my daughter's a graduate of the college. We support the college, as, as you stated, but uh, it's a horse event. It's an equestrian event. It's, it's a wonderful event if you've never actually seen a show jumping event. It's quite amazing. Well, sitting here listening to it, it sounds like a great event, like it's going to be a lot of fun, and I hope you have a huge turnout uh, this year and raise a lot of money for HCC students for their scholarships. So thank you both for being here. And for those of you who thought that roller skating was a thing of the past, like I did, well, we're wrong because every weekend, CA Skating Arena is packing them in. Now, Dennis Matty met with Julie Seidman, the skating manager, and DJ Barb Snyder to find out just what makes this so popular. I'm here today at the Supreme Sports Club speaking with Julie Seidman. Julie is the general manager for the skating operation, and with Barb Snyder, who is the DJ and assistant manager. Julie, can you tell me something about the skating? Is it open to the general public? Is it members only, or how does that work? Yes, it is open to the general public. Mm -hmm. Our, the mission is $6 for non-members. The mission for the members is free with a CA card. Uh -huh. The roller skates are $3, and the roller blades are $4. It is open Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, Friday evening from 7 to 10, Saturday from 1 to 4, and 7 to 10 and Sunday also from 1 to 4, which that is a change uh, that started in January for Sunday hours that just changed for us. Um, also, when Howard County schools are closed oh. due to a teacher's meeting or an all-day holiday, then we are also open from 1 to 4. And I understand that usually there's 100 or 200 or 300 people here skating. Yes, on a Friday evenings we are pretty crowded. That is our teenage nights. Our, um, Family skating sessions are basically on Saturdays and Sundays. The families come out with their small children. That's the time for them to practice. We also have birthday parties as well. 
about birthday parties, you do the birthday parties and understand that there's been people who've come back after years and, and told you that they had birthday parties here 10 or 15 years ago. Exactly, and it, we, we love that. When they come back uh, and tell us that we're part of their memories as growing up as children, it warms our heart. And we had just recently, um, we had bar mitzvahs, bat mitzvahs. We uh -huh. have all kinds of special events here. We had, uh, may I tell you about the Skateland reunion? And, well, yeah, Skateland reunion, people from 20 years ago or 25 years exactly. ago came back. Came back. They came back and they said it just felt like home uh, to, where they can socialize together. Uh -huh. Many of them couldn't uh, dance. They, they had no real sport. But to them, skating was their sport. Now, um, there's also corporate parties. Exactly. We have, we have uh, lots of nearby restaurants come. Yeah. We've had uh, scouting groups come. So we, we're open to weddings, uh, anniversary parties. We just, we do everything. I've heard a lot and there's just all kinds of people throughout the community who have been here, who have been here as kids, who have, who have had parties here. So I know that it means a lot to the community to have this here. And you've been DJing for how many years? Well, uh, this will be my 30th year. And um, I, at one time I said 20, then I said, oh, no, 30. I'm going for 40. Okay, I don't blame you. <laughs> and the music's probably changed just a little bit over that period of time? A lot. But one thing we try to do here is we want everybody that comes to be part of the session. Mm -hmm. So we allow them to come up and request music. We play a variety of music um, from country to R&B to hip-hop to uh alternative music. We want everybody to feel welcome when they come here. I've noticed when I've been here on weekends, it's very family friendly. So I see, I, I see a lot of moms and dads here with their little kids and it just looks like so much fun. It is fun. And they come up and they tell us it's fun. I know that there are a lot of uh, adults that come here and drop their kids off mm -hmm. and they can work out in the club while the kids are skating. That's why having a, a skating rink inside of a health club is wonderful because we have the parents going down the hall, they exercise, the children are with us, and then when the parents come back, they put on skates, and they skate because they know it's a low-impact aerobic activity. Julie, for additional information, how do I, how do I get, who do I call, what's the website? Um, you can contact us at 410-381-5355, that is the club number, or you can visit our website as well. Um, Barbara knows the website. Um, I memorized it. It's <laughs> www.columbiaskatearena.org. For a person who doesn't know how to use a computer, I'm proud. <laughs> there you go. Well, just a few minutes from now, this place will be packed with skaters. Many of my friends have taken courses at the Columbia Arts Center, so I thought I'd stop by to see what courses they're offering for seniors during the fall. Joining me will be the day and youth programmer, Monica Herber. Come on inside. Oh, yeah. Monica? Hi, Kathy. Excuse me, Christina. I was hoping some of your instructors here could help me bring out my creative side. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Can you tell me something about the programs you have for seniors this fall? Sure. Um, we have the Senior Crafty Corner, which is mm -hmm. um, the second Wednesday of every month from 10 to 11 o'clock. And the projects are um, based on the season. It's basically for any skill level, so you can, you know, have our beginners and then the experienced artists can add, you know, their own flavor to the projects. Are these classes just in the fall or all year long? No, they're all year long. Right? Mm -hmm. And we also have a lot of day programs like watercolor classes, painting classes, and a very good ceramics department for seniors as well that are offered during the day. Class sizes usually range from, you know, anywhere from 5 to 15 at the most, so people really have one-on-one -on -one opportunities. How about if I show you around? We have a great gallery gift shop upstairs. Oh, that would be good. Yeah, let's go. All right. This way? Yep. This is our gallery shop. Ooh. Look at all these things. Are these all your students and teachers? Yes. All the work here is created by our students and teachers. Ooh, nice. And this is by Susan, who you'll be meeting in a little bit. Okay. Um, tell me a little bit about the Salon Series. The Salon Series is a lecture series that's free. It's mm -hmm. here on Monday nights at 7 o'clock, and it's just a different variety of subjects. We have performing artists come, we have artists that want to talk about their work. It sounds very interesting. I, I can't wait to get started. Let's go. Kathy, this is Susan Kiefer. She's one of our instructors here at the so Art Center. She does a lot of different classes. She does um, decoupage and decorative painting and the bangle, the necklace that she's wearing, the crochet necklace that she's wearing, and a lot of different jewelry classes and stuff. So she's going to give us a little instruction. So today we're going to be working on some ceramics. We can use all kinds of ceramic paint. 
Um, what we're going to be using today is a lot of the metallics. You know, we're doing art. It's fun. <laughs> okay. <laughs> What's your first question? Where can I register and what are the fees? Uh, you can register, um, you can call us here at the Art Center, or you can stop in, or you can also fax us. How can our viewers get more information? They can go to our website at columbiaartcenter.org, and all of the information about birthday parties, all our classes are on there, the salon series, when our gallery exhibits are, all that information is on our website. Thank you very much for meeting with me today. Sure, I'm glad you came. This is fun. CA's Community Solutions Program was developed to allow Columbia residents a platform to voice their concerns and share feedback. Here to tell us how the program works is CA President Phil Nelson. Welcome, Phil. Thank you. So tell us, how does the program work? The program is basically set up to where, uh, you know, just to kind of go back a little bit, I was a city manager for about 35 years. Right. And we had a, one of the biggest complaints we ever had was people who said they got to run around at City Hall because they couldn't find or they didn't know the right department to go to. So in the last two cities I was in, we instituted similar programs mm -hmm. and basically it's to allow one contact point where people can call or email and get answers quickly. Uh, we try to do this within a 24 hour period. Most of the time we try to do it immediately if the person can give us the, uh, the information that they need. Okay, so why did you find that um, to be a need here in this community? Well, it's similar. I mean, we're okay. a pretty big organization. We're not really centralized. We have a lot of different facilities. Uh, CA itself owns 42 different buildings, and we have lots of different outplaces. Uh, so we thought maybe if we just give someone a central location they can call, uh, our customer service representatives, or solutions representatives, I should say, uh, will answer the question from a sheet of frequently asked questions that okay. they have, or they also have a kind of a string of of fellow CSRs in the different service bureaus we have that they can get the information uh, very rapidly and get back to the individual. Okay. We don't want to have people feel like they've been dumped on five or six different people right. to try to get an answer. We want to get that answer as quickly as possible, hopefully within 24 hours. And what happens if you can't get the answer within 24 hours? If they need more detailed information or if we have to do some research, we still try to get them the answer within 72 hours. Do you give them a call and let them know yes. we're working on it and we'll get back to you? It's just trying to do a better job of customer service and trying to offer solutions rather than adding to a problem. Thank you for stopping by and we'll see you next month. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dr. Harry Oaken for Columbia Matters. This month we're talking about concussions. Their frequency is quite high. One to three million traumatic brain events occur each year related to recreational sports. We're gonna talk about the mechanism of what happens after a concussion, how to treat it, and how to prevent it. Concussion is defined as a traumatic induced alteration in mental status. People who have a concussion kind of get their clock cleaned, or their head banged. They may be dazed or disoriented, sometimes confused. Sometimes concussion does not involve the loss of consciousness. In fact, most times it doesn't. Its end result can be loss of memory for the events immediately before or after the trauma. Ultimately, a severe concussion can cause some significant neurologic deficits. Following a concussion, there can be actual physical, metabolic, and chemical changes that take place in the brain. A severe concussion can also be accompanied by a skull fracture or a contusion of the brain, that's a bruise of the brain, or sometimes bleeding around the brain. You may have heard the term subdural hematoma. So the head is encased by a very thick bone, the skull bone. It can absorb a lot of energy. However, even a lot of energy that can be absorbed by the skull still has the brain moving within the skull. The brain is actually sitting in a fluid, the cerebral spinal fluid. It's sort of surrounded by water almost. So the brain is actually can move. And during trauma, the kinetic energy gets dispersed into the brain. The skull may absorb some of it, but there may be movement of the brain. So the brain can actually twist or turn, and that injury can cause significant neurologic issues as well. The tissue of the brain actually can absorb the kinetic energy as well, and that can cause deterioration or changes within the structure of the brain. The axines within the brain can actually shift and they can break. 
this can add to the pathogenesis for why a concussion causes multiple issues and problems. The symptoms reported by athletes are as follows. They may have a headache, most do. They may feel nauseous or feel their balance is off. They may have fuzzy vision or be sensitive to light or noise. Most report feeling sluggish and not themselves or foggy. Their sleep may change and they may have concentration or memory problems. The treatment for a mild to moderate concussion is rather simple. We want to remove the player or the participant from the activity as a second trauma to the head could cause more problems. This also may entail some time out even from school. If the, if the participant is having headaches, not concentrating well, they need rest, good hydration, and good nourishment. The decision to put somebody back in the game rests with the coach or physician depending on how they've neurologically responded. What we want to avoid, again, is a second hit to the brain that would increase the likelihood of another injury. So let's finish up with prevention. In any sport where there's a reasonable likelihood that you may have head trauma, wear a helmet. Whether it's skiing, or biking, or motorcycling, or if you're playing group sports such as lacrosse or football, wear your helmet. This has been Health with Dr. Harry Oaken. I'll see you next month. Wildlife isn't the first thing you think about when you think about Columbia. But with its thousands of acres of open space and careful planning, Columbia has indeed created places that foster the growth of birds and other small animals. Michael Oberman is an avid witness to nature. With a sophisticated camera, a great deal of skill, and a lot of patience, he has spotted and captured on his camera close to 100 species of birds and other animals. Let's meet up with him. Hi, Michael. Can I interrupt you? Of course, Barbara. Great. It's a beautiful night here and peaceful, but a lot of bird noise in the background and some birds on the lake. You are probably the most avid witness I know of, of the nature in Colombia. Well, thank you for saying witness of nature because some people think I'm a birder. And I'm not a birder. I love birds. They just present themselves more than any other animal species here at the lake. But tonight, we've got four juvenile green herons. They're out early. They're fishing, looking for dragonflies, and learning about life. So there's one about 50 feet from us now. And it's not scared of us because it was born here. And it's kind of used to humans right now. So what, I what other birds have you seen out here? Well, we'll start with the biggest and go down to the smallest. Uh, bald eagles, osprey, uh, red-tailed hawks, red-shouldered hawks, cooper's hawks. So that's a variety of raptors. And when you see them, you usually see them going after a fish or a squirrel or a vole or some rodent. Um, down to this, the small birds, the passerines, the songbirds, you've got the the beauty of having had six Baltimore Oriole nests here at the lake this season, including one right here in the tree next to us. Um, so you name it, I, I know that I've photographed 84 species of birds here. Is Wild Lake a particularly favorite spot for you? It is because it's so close to where I live. There's an abundance of wildlife. Yeah, unlike Centennial Lake, where a lot of people are running and bicycling, the noise you get here is usually from walkers. And Kittimacundi I go to quite often. Of all the species that you have photographed and, and witnessed, what would you consider the, the hardest to spot here? The hardest to spot are the ones that I've never spotted. But I know they're here because I hear their voice. I hear their sounds. And I know they're in the trees somewhere and I can't find them. Then the next hardest to spot, we just saw one, is the belted kingfisher, because they'll land on a tree and stay there for a few minutes, and then they're gone. They're fishing, and they're very fast and very small, and their flight is very erratic, so to try to follow them is very difficult. So with this abundance of Canada geese, does that interfere with other species living in this area, or does it help? 
I, I think it helps um, because this little bit of an island that's grown up here from silt coming downstream has become a birthing place and a nesting place for Canada geese. Um, they are here to stay. They're not going anywhere. And part of why the Canada geese stay here is they use maps of the earth to find their way back north. And when big box stores started getting built, they lost their way and they settled wherever there was water. So these are mostly resident Canada geese. How long have you been interested in photographing nature? Nature, about seven years. And that came from a trip to New Mexico where the light was perfect. I had my first digital camera. It wasn't even a single lens reflex. It was a Fuji point and shoot. When I came home, I looked at the photos and said, I can hang some of these on my wall. The light's perfect, everything worked. And then I said to Mary Jane, I think I'll buy a digital single lens reflex and then that's what hooked me. I know you do post a lot of your photographs on Flickr. Yes. Uh, and that gives everybody all over the world the opportunity to see, to see them. What has that led to? Well, I've had a little over 1,700,000 hits on my Flickr photos in the last four years. It's led to my photos being licensed by the National Park Service, Fish and Wildlife, on permanent display overlooking the Columbia River Gorge, at the trailhead to the Sierra Nevadas. It's led to book deals uh, for my photos being used in books, magazines, uh, European newspapers, American newspapers. Etc. And where can people see your work locally? Well, the, I've, I've got a museum exhibition, my first museum exhibition coming up in January at the Ratner Museum in Bethesda. I think the opening's January 9th. Um, locally, I show at Slayton House Gallery in Wild Lake Village Center. And of course, my Flickr site, if you look up OZONI11, Ozoni11, I think I've got over 5,000 shots posted there now. So the equipment is, of course, an important part of taking good pictures, but when you're trying to capture birds and other small animals, what, what's the second most important part of this operation? Learning how to use the equipment. And that's a problem because people are so used to instant gratification that they take a camera out of the box. If it's a point and shoot, they put it on automatic and they go out and shoot. And that little auto camera is not going to freeze a bird in flight. So you've got to learn what shutter priority is, what aperture priority is. Mostly you've got to learn about light. And light is the most important thing to a nature photographer. So thank you so much. This has just been fun and enlightening. And I think on my next walk around Wild Lake, I'm going to sit and stop a while. Well, call me and I'll walk with you, Barbara. OK, thanks. Thank you. And thank you for watching. Tune in again next month as we continue to explore Columbia. Call the Senior Events Shuttle for free curb-to-curb -curb evening and weekend transportation to culture events in Howard County. The shuttle takes groups of four or more seniors, ages 60 and above, to events around town such as outdoor concerts at the Town Center Lakefront or Toby's Dinner Theater. Don't miss a minute of all the fun in Columbia. Call 410-715-3087 to plan your upcoming trip.